Okay. So, um, uh, so again, hello everyone. Um, my name is Julia, and as Rafaele was mentioning, please feel free to interrupt, ask question, any curiosity, whatever. Um, I would be happy to answer. So, um, to start with, I think it is important to give a brief introduction about what is actually space economy and the concept behind, because I don't know how many of you are actually familiar with this term. So to begin with, the terms refer to all the activities and the use of the cosmos resources to create additional benefits to the human beings worldwide, of course, on the international stage, and mainly through scientific and technological research, development, and infrastructures. So it is mainly about the integration of space into the society and economy. And it concerns, of course, a variety of activities that range from deep space exploration and so the understanding of what happens exactly outside of the Earth boundaries to the employment of space services, like, for example, the GNSS system or the possibility to monitor also what happens down on Earth and so on. But I will come back to this later. And it is only actually recently that space economy has become a trend and has become like an official social financial sector for different countries. As if we have to think about the space has always been a domain accessible only by states and that the expansion of commercial businesses in this environment, also called the democratization of space, has led to the emerging of new realities, which are mostly startups that drive the technological innovation pretty fast. But this is also possible because um, they are supported by relevant funds that support their research and development activities in both, in both the upstream and downstream segment. So I don't know how many of you are actually familiar with these terms, but while the upstream segment refers to the manufacturing part of the value chain, which is it consists mostly in the objects that are sent into space, so space launchers or satellites, for example, the downstream segment um, concerns um, all the services that are enabled by space. And this is particularly expanding as a business, and it's particularly interesting to see how it is developing because it concerns, for example, infrastructure monitoring, search and rescue activities, climate change, mitigation measures, urban development, and so on. So it's incredible rich. And all this new era is called the new space and is characterized mainly by a relevant interest of new actors that are ready to invest in space enterprises, such as Primo Space here with us today, a faster, better, cheaper approach that has firstly boosted the proliferation of enterprises that use also commercial COTS technologies, which means commercial off the shelf technologies. And these are technologies that can be easily found on the market. And so they're commercially available. And then have permit also to build um, space vehicle in a shorter time framework. This means like, for example, CubeSats, which are like pretty small satellites and they're like each side is, is big, it's large, like around 10 centimeters per side and weighs more or less about one kilogram. And, and also this has permitted also to lower the cost to access the space domain. And this is incredible because if we consider that around the 70s and the beginning of 2000, the cost to send um, one kilogram was around more than $20,000 um, per kilogram. And now it has lowered also thanks of course to big tech companies like for example, SpaceX, uh, it has lowered to $2,000 per kilo um, around. And in general, this is, uh, this is particularly relevant if we consider that in the past, it has often represented an obstacle to, ac to, access, uh, to access space for the majority of countries because they just couldn't afford going to space. And now we have around 90 countries that operate in space and to which belong also a high amount of space operators because I was reading that only in 2021, there were more than 10,000 companies. So it's incredible. It's incredible to see this transaction from the public to the private sector. And I think it is also like very interesting also to remark and highlight that 
some of the objects that we use actually daily in our daily routine actually derive from space. Like for example, um, in our glasses, we have the scratch resistant lenses, they derive from space, but also athletic shoes, dust busters, laptops, AirPods, and so on. And at the same time, like for example, and which is in my opinion, amazing, like currently on the International Space Station, there is a small robot called Simon 2, which has been developed by Airbus together with IBM and the, space, and the German Aerospace Agency. And, it, and the, main, the main topic is actually to provide technical support to the astronaut, but it's also equipped with an artificial, uh, artificial intelligence system that is capable to detect the astronaut's feelings and so providing emotional support, which is incredible. And the value of all um, this industry, according to Space Foundation, was already, um, was estimated to be around 500 billion of dollars uh, and is expected also to grow and become a trillion dollar uh, industry by 2040. But here I want to stress out that most of the values that you are going to read on the internet are only estimation because it's still very difficult being a newborn field to collect all the data and make pressure, um, precise measurements. So because for example, there is another report by Aero Consult, and of course you can reach me on LinkedIn or per email, I will write you the email down if you're interested in those reports so you can have a look at this data. And that was showing that, for example, 82% of all the space market is actually dedicated to the space, uh, to commercial purposes, and that, um, um, it, and that the space market is prospected to, to grow by more than 70% by 2030. And, um, and yeah, and as I was mentioning before, actually, that the space economy is not only about money and everything, but it's also about providing and increasing the well-being of the society. And for example, in this framework, a key role this place is played by the Earth observation, which consists in the capacity um, to observe Earth from space through the satellite's capabilities. And this in turn provides a more efficient and informed decision-making process that now represents also an increasing business to for, for companies that buy this data or collect this data also from open source um, data that are provided, for example, by Copernicus or by, La, or by the Landsat satellites and apply artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to analyze and interpret this data to then sell them again to other companies that need to respond uh, to find efficient response measures to specific needs. And uh, Earth observation, for example, was particularly used uh, and is still now in the military field, but is now enlarged to other fields, which is agriculture, for example, for the irrigation management, forestry for air quality analysis, onshore and offshore, oil field monitoring, energy production forecasting, and so on. Um, but on the other side, uh, there are also new businesses that make their money by focusing also on issues that derive from the intensive commercialization of space and that concerns both an environmental problem, but it affects also the data and the transmission of data through the satellite channels, affecting its integrity, confidentiality and availability of the information that are transmitted. In fact, um, space is becoming day by day an increasingly contested and congested domain. And because there are um, particularly, there is an increasingly economic value behind, of course, on the other side, there are even more actors, not necessarily only countries, and that might be interested in affecting the normal functionalities and operation of the satellite. Um, to inject, for example, of, of false data or block the transmission. And this, of course, is a big, is a very big issue uh, presently, because um, especially for space operators, they lose the investments and they lose their investments. And it takes a lot of time to build again a satellite from scratch and to reconstruct all the supply chain and and regain all the, all the components that have been lost. But fortunately, there are increasingly companies and research entities that are building AI systems that are able to, to, the, to target these security threats. And um, yeah, um, I'm almost to the conclusion. So I don't know if anyone has, has any question because otherwise I would 
say just a little thing. Um, yeah. I don't think if there are any questions. So before I leave the floor to Rafael and Mauro, I would like you to give a look to this website. Um, give me one second. I'll send you the link in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, did it work? Um, Can you see? Can you see the presentation? Did you receive the link? Yes, both. Okay. Okay. Great. So, um, if you look, if you're currently looking at the link I've sent to you, there's currently another important problem that concerns space junk, and that can be fine in space, and where again artificial intelligence might represent a possible solution. And if you and you will probably wonder, okay, how has it come so far? Because not so many people are aware that actually we're, we're affecting not only the earth environment, but also the space environment, which is very, which is very dangerous. And just to give you a few numbers, um, the number of satellites that have been launched from the start of the space era, so back to 1957, is, our, is more than... Um, 12,000 satellites and um, and the estimated numbers of uh, explosion collisions or not or anomalous events is around uh, is more is around 600 uh, 600 uh, ac accidents and so you can very well understand how this represents an obstacle for future human activities as it might be dangerous also for the safety of the astronauts but also for the position of future satellites as not all these small objects that derive from the fragmentation of the satellites can be tracked and cataloged. And, and there's still countries that to demonstrate their powers still launch satellites into the orbit and let satellites explode, uh, affecting even more the space environment. And But luckily, we're lucky that there is artificial intelligence system that um, on which currently it is researched to build this AI system on the satellite in order that the satellite can detect if there is another space, space vehicle coming towards and avoid the crash. So, yes, I don't know if there are any, any uh, other questions. Otherwise, I would leave the floor to Rafael Mauro. Okay, uh, thank you, Julia. And uh, so if uh, any question will rise up, I will uh, yeah. uh, sorry, uh, contact you anyway. So um, let's start with a couple of considerations. First of all, uh, we we saw the the, um, the the very significant growth of the space economy. Uh, there are actually at least four forces uh, uh, that are behind the recent growth and, uh, and and actually the new space or space 2.0 is the product of those forces. Uh, the first one was already mentioned. So the cost reduction, uh, cost reduction with two sides. First, the, uh, the reduction of the cost for putting um, a kilogram of stuff in orbit, uh, which was millions of dollars decades ago, then hundreds of thousands of dollars, then uh, decades of dollars, and uh, now it's few thousands and then uh, it's, it will continue to, to go down. So there is something like a moves low uh, in space. The second uh, cost, uh, um, cost reduction is of course the hardware. Um, Julia mentioned the um, commercial of the shelf hardware. So uh, the new formats like the, uh, the CubeSats, they are li like Lego bricks. Uh, you can uh, put them together at a very low cost uh, and they are like the smartphones for space. And, th and that, that, that's incredibly important because this uh, explosion of accessibility is enabling startups, uh, student groups, uh, even uh, uh, do-it-yourself groups, amateurs to, to build uh, uh, projects uh, uh, for space. The second uh, powerful force uh, is the private sector, because just until a few decades ago, space was just about governments or large corporations being contractors for governments. The, the, the new wave, the, what happened during the last 20 years, was the, uh, the, the incredible growth of uh, startups and startups' mindsets within the space industry. So like uh, agile uh, manufacturing, uh, lean manufacturing, uh, uh, new kind of uh, um, um, uh, 
uh, organizational styles with the not so much hierarchies and bureaucracy, uh, the application of 3D printing, uh, computational design, and other kinds of innovations that uh, uh, are basically changing changing the DNA of the of this industry. Um, the, the government side is still very relevant. Actually, the budget of the space agencies and the government's budgets for space are continuing to increase, but the proportion of, uh, of the private sector overall is increasing and it is increasing with, with new rules. Uh, the third the third force uh, I will say is the application side. Uh, the, we already are using multiple uh, uh, space applications in telecommunication, in uh, weather prediction, uh, in geolocalization, but uh, there is a new wave of earth applications powered by space infrastructure. Uh, for instance, for agriculture, irrigation, logistics, uh, infrastructure monitoring, insurance, uh, environmental protection. Uh, th there is a, um, uh, a multiplication of uh, things that are useful on Earth, uh, empowered by space data uh, and space tele telecommunication. Um, one of the key elements there is the uh, merging between the internet infrastructure and the space infrastructure. And that's the reason why uh, most of the type of the tech companies Apple, Google, Facebook, uh, Tencent, and so on. They are investing uh, in space technology, acquiring space startups, uh, building their, their own uh, satellite constellations. Um, the, the, the fourth element is geopolitics. Uh, geopolitics was always uh, relevant uh, as a dimension uh, when we when we reflect about space science and space, space technology. Uh, especially during the Cold War, but now it's again very relevant. So basically the, uh, the conflict, the, the conflict uh, between uh, the, especially the Western world, the United States against China. And unfortunately after the, UK, the Ukraine uh, crisis uh, uh, with Russia is basically deglobalizing space, militarizing space. And the most of the uh, international collaborations, global international collaborations built during the last 30 years uh, are now breaking down. And uh, projects uh, like the International Space Station that were based on a very broad collaboration between the United States, Russia, Europe, and so on, they are actually any more uh, possible. So uh, what we will see in the future is a multiplication of uh, space projects uh, uh, with uh, basically um, sovereign uh, declination. And uh, we already have now the two space stations, uh, the, the international one and the Chinese one, but uh, we will see this kind of dynamics in multiple, uh, in multiple uh, dimensions. Final note on that is the, uh, is the, the, the very existence of the Space Force. So uh, an entire military, military branch in the United States uh, uh, with, a cost, with a separate line of command uh, just for space, just for space awareness, uh, logistics, and uh, um, power projection. Uh, this is very, very relevant. So um, uh, in the space, in the new space economy, there is another concept that for me is very uh, significant. And uh, it's the, the concept of space as an environment, not just as an industry. So uh, space is increasingly an environment where other industries are doing things or recombining themselves within. So um, we mentioned agriculture, we mentioned the uh, uh, telecommunication, but actually, um, Basically, all large companies, uh, uh, if they use data, they often use data obtained by, sat by, sat by satellite infrastructure. So um, the space economy, at least as an investor, is the product of the recombination of uh, multiple industries. Um, and we see this in the way in the world of uh, startups. So Julia, maybe you can go in the slide with the name of the startups. Uh, thank you. So uh, this is a few examples of the on the companies that uh, were the, the, the subjects or in, present in our portfolio. So we invested in, in these six uh, uh, companies plus one, which is not mentioned, plus two uh, that we are uh, yet to be yet to announce. Um, I think that for this audience. Uh, ICO space and um, Caracol are particularly uh, interesting because ICO is an artificial intelligence company. So it's a software company, but focused on space applications. Um, uh, it was born from a team uh, in uh, Turin, a group of postdocs and PhDs 
of the Politecnico di Torino, and um, they started basically as amateurs working on CubeSat projects, and then they so founded this software company uh, focused on um, the, the two main dimensions of uh, uh, artificial intelligence for space. One is uh, navigation, so the um, awareness, trajectories, uh, positioning of uh, satellites in order to, to make them more autonomous, like many other industries uh, on Earth. Um, and the second dimension is Earth observation. So basically um, uh, helping uh, uh, the people building applications with uh, satellite images, uh, trying to find, uh, to recognize patterns within those images. So they are uh, with a typical uh, uh, family, um, family of algorithms for pattern recognition. So that's very interesting. And I think there are multiple uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, space startups uh, actually pitching now uh, investors um, also for other applications, for instance, um, you can apply, uh, for instance, statistical learning in order to predict uh, data uh, from the past into the future for specific applications like insurance or finance. Uh, and there are many interesting things that are in development now. Um, another example is Caracol. Um, Caracol is um, a company based near Como. Um, uh, they, uh, they are a manufacturing company and they build uh, uh, basically uh, custom made large uh, components for the um, aerospace um, uh, automotive and nautical industry and they do this with the uh, robots basically with robotic arms they perform additive manufacturing but, but for very large components so it's different from the 3d printing uh, inside the oven it's a very large uh, um, facility and um, very smart team integrating different kind of uh, uh, competencies uh, from uh, computational design to mechanical engineering uh, to uh, aerospace engineering and uh, growing very quickly and also we invested 1.5 million euros in Caracol and also 1.5 in uh, in ICO. Uh, both great companies and connected with the 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 the, the, the line of thinking uh, of automation and uh, and um, and uh, new software. A uh, couple of examples from other companies, just to provide you a perspective. Um, there are companies uh, building uh, uh, Internet of Things uh, systems, uh, but powered by uh, satellite technology, like Astrocast in Switzerland. Uh, they are developing um, IoT systems with uh, for the non-domestic uh, applications like for um, um, oil and gas, uh, uh, mining, uh, um, uh, maritime uh, applications and so on. And, uh, and they are doing this uh, combining uh, uh, a constellation of uh, nanosatellites. They are basically, they already launched 10 satellites and they were they are building a constellation of 100 satellites uh, with the modules that they are communicating with the objects on Earth on, and, their, and then the telecommunication on, and on the L-band. Um, other example, uh, a very cool example is uh, Siderius, Siderius, pardon, um, it's a Latin word, so it's Siderius. Um, Siderius Space Dynamics uh, is a uh, um, company born in Naples, but then uh, we moved in Turin um, and they are building from scratch a new type of rocket. So they are a launch technology company and um, building something like the, the personal computers of rockets. So something very small that could be launched without so much infrastructure or very low cost. And uh, the fun fact is that the team is composed by 20 years old people. So like to zero to one, something like that. And uh, they are reinventing from scratch the technology and uh, you know, very quick, uh, very dynamic and interesting way. So as you can see from these just few examples, uh, just in Italy, uh, excepting from Astrocast, there are multiple, multiple segments that you can uh, consider when we speak about uh, uh, space. Um, as a venture investor, the interesting thing is that uh, there is an enormous uh, um, momentum behind this industry for both the good reasons like cost reduction and the, I would say the wrong reasons like the, you know, the, the, the ge geopolitical situation um, uh, and uh, the volume of venture funds invested in space basically doubled every year during the last uh, three years and um, the, the, the kind of uh, 
talent uh, that is that those companies are looking for is very diverse. So it's not just uh, aerospace engineers, but also software developers, uh, uh, mechanical engineers, uh, marketing people, uh, finance people, uh, but uh, attention to the dynamic of uh, this specific industry. So uh, I encourage you to explore it because uh, it's full of, of opportunities now. Um, final note for me uh, is the um, is the how to how to get information on your from on your side so there are multiple sources uh, for instance in italian language uh, there is a very good blog called astrospace uh, they are both uh, on the website and on facebook and they are um, they have the perfect combination of uh, being uh, um, able to communicate, but in a very rigorous way. So the, most of the people writing there are students of physics uh, or um, engineers and so on, but with the communication abilities. And also um, uh, some space influencers like uh, Adrian Fartade uh, and, um, and others. Uh, in the English language, uh, also there are multiple interesting sources. There are multiple books now on the Space 2.0 or the New Space Economy. And... Um, a lot of influencers like Kelly Girardi and uh, and uh, and others. So um, th there are ways to 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 gain awareness about the industry, and I encourage you to do so. So uh, there are, we can deep dive on any of these topics, and I will uh, have to receive questions and uh, start a conversation. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Raffaele and Giulia. <laughs> thank you. It was a really interesting. By the way, I, I'm, I'm reading on the chat a couple of questions. Maybe you can, if you can ask the, the, um, the chat, you can, you can read them. If not, I can, I can do it. Um, I'm, I'm by my side, I'm really, um, really interested in what you just mentioned, that uh, a space is not just uh, um, a place for physicists, uh, astronauts, pilots, uh, or engineer, aeronautical, aerospace engineers, but uh, it uh, could be a, uh, a place for almost everybody, let's say, uh, for people in law, for people in, uh, in marketing. Uh, so this is quite uh, fascinating and also inspiring. Thank you. And um, uh, Cristiano, I totally agree with you. I think that the, the, cool, the, the cool component of uh, space is that uh, it, it's an incentive for thinking long term, to think about the future, to invest, to uh, study, to inform yourself. And, you know, after two years of being closed physically and also in our minds, I think is a, is a, good, is a good way to approach uh, our life. Uh, yes, if, if I can add another comment, because uh, a lot of times when I'm uh, talking about uh, space, uh, in particular about space exploration, uh, people, uh, some criticism, uh, arise the, the question of, uh, okay, but we have a lot of issues here on Earth, we have a lot of problems on our Earth, why should we care about going uh, into space? Uh, my uh, answer in general is uh, not only about the application of, uh, uh, like Julia mentioned before, many applications that are coming from space to, to the ground, let's say, but uh, um, I always remember people that uh, also um, uh, climate movements uh, were born in the 60s and in particular in the 70s after the Apollo missions because um, of the overview effect. Uh, so many astronauts were going uh, in, uh, in, into space, in particular they were going on the moon and when coming back they realized how small and how beautiful is our earth and they were taking picture about, uh, about it and as soon as this picture were seen from people from earth everybody realized this overview effect so we can see the earth from very uh, far away and we can realize that we are let's say just a small world all together and uh, it's really uh, strange that we are fighting all together because we are essentially in the same home. So uh, climate movements were born uh, after the space exploration, and, and this is one of the main achievements, more than uh, 
some other tech technologies that were born in space, but this idea of being uh, uh, all together uh, was one of the achievements. So this is my answer. I don't know what, what's your answer, Julia, Raffaele, about the people saying, but why you are going to the space when we have a lot of issues here on Earth to, to tackle? Julia, do you want to start? I, I can start, yes. So um, space exploration is, is important. Not It was important, first of all, for military purposes, of course, and for the safety for national security purposes. But at the same time, it allows us to develop also um, and, and teach us also to, to live in a more sustainable way because also what they're doing currently going back to the moon and to Mars, it will, it will develop new businesses. Like for example, space mining and space mining will be the future by acquiring those minerals and resources that we have also on earth, but to don't waste them and don't create and don't affect it in a more badly way. We will go on other planets, take it so that our planet can actually heal. So it is, it is very, very important. Space exploration, space resources, space experiments and so on. So I'm not in the technical part and the scientific part, but I can suggest you to read more about it because it's very interesting. Thank you. So basically, I, I totally agree with uh, what both Cristiano and uh, Julia said. I would just add that um, even when there is not a direct connection between uh, uh, space uh, investments in science and uh, technical spin-off on Earth, on Earth, there is some connection uh, maybe decades later. And that's evident if we look at the history of theoretical physics or experimental physics. So if uh, uh, I have some family member that is not very well, but when they have a um, um, positron emission tomography or a magnetic resonance, that's because uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, there was uh, research on uh, theoretical and particle physics. So uh, the, the, the same is true for the investment in, in the International Space Station. So that kind, this kind of very ambitious, uh, stretching technical goals, uh, uh, they pay off at the end. So I think that, that that's, that's very true and uh, that goes beyond the immediate uh, impact. Um, um, yes. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. No. no, no, please, please. No, thank you. I was just uh, to add another comment that uh, uh, just to remind everybody that not today, it was today, but instead it, it, it is postponed to tomorrow. It's a very important day for space exploration, in particular also for Italian space exploration, because uh, Samantha Cristoforetti will, um, will travel to the International Space Agency, uh, Space uh, Station tomorrow, if I, tomorrow morning, if I'm not wrong. Um, so uh, she will be the captain of the yeah, ISS. And uh, just to add another, another point, uh, a lot of uh, experiments uh, from physics are, are done on the station, on the, in particular because uh, on Earth, gravity is very noisy and you can also achieve uh, quantum experiments more easily in space without gravity. And so stuff like uh, um, Bose-Einstein condensation, entanglement and stuff like that, that have several applications in quantum uh, computing and quantum technology can be tested easily on, uh, on the International Space Station and in space in general. So I quit myself. There are a lot of questions on, on the chat and you can answer it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I was reading. So Rafael, I think we can start maybe from the space junk, from the yeah. space debris. And the question is how to solve the problem of space garbage. AI may be useful to prevent incident in the short term, but where's the real solution right now? Okay, so I don't know. Do you want to start or can I go first? Um, it's the same for me. So if you want to go first, Okay, so um, first of all, uh, the solution that is nowadays used is either to the orbit the satellite in in a, in, a, in an orbit that is far 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 away from Earth, or otherwise let it burn into the atmosphere. But it's to both both ways. It's very it's very extensive because it needs like a tons of propellant, and it's very difficult. So it means that when you send your satellite up in space you have to calculate how much propellant there should remain in order to deorbit 
the your satellite or otherwise what are there what they're now developing besides um this AI detector that detects a satellite com coming towards your space object is our robotic arms. And so satellites that use this, this arm to take other satellites and let them deorbit. So, and in, in the long term, and actually besides also, okay, technological development and so on that might help for sure their needs that the international organizations need to intervene because the space law is still not, is still developing. It's still, it's a new field and, but there are issues that must be addressed like very urgently. So Rafael, up to you now. Yeah, basically, no, basically I agree that the, my main message is that there is not a single silver bullet. So there is not a single technology or a single solution for solving the space uh, debris problem. Uh, there are some of them are already in place, like uh, the, the commissioning uh, of uh, end of life satellites mentioned by Julia uh, or the uh, detection. So being aware of the fragments uh, of objects uh, in space, but it's, it's not not enough so there are uh, we, we see multiple startups are trying to pitch different kind of uh, creative technologies to do that like developing uh, uh, sticky materials uh, to to gather very small uh, fragments in orbit uh, to uh, new sensing technologies to uh, very low cost the orbiting technologies uh, and so on but uh, there is not a single solution and from the social and political point of view there are multiple dimensions because there, there is the legal point of view like uh, requiring uh, uh, as a standard uh, feature uh, all the satellite manufacturers to install uh, the commissioning systems uh, but there are also geopolitical things because uh, um uh the the uh, basically there is there are often uh anti-satellite weapons tests so basically uh large countries like india china united states russia they have uh, anti-satellite uh, uh, rockets uh, from earth to orbit uh, uh, why they have them because they want to be able to destroy the communication and command and control capability of uh, the enemy and uh, what but what happens during those tests that they destroy typically um a garbage satellite in thousands of pieces and no one can stop this so no law no uh, regulation could uh, um, uh, could uh, intervene stop this so it, despite self restriction so i actually the news of just a few days ago that the united states they told that they will stop for now uh, uh, the azat uh, uh, testing uh, um, the testing but uh, it's not easy. So uh, it's a very, uh, it's, it's, it's the far west there. So, um, um, so there, there is not a single solution. So that's my point. Um, there was another question regarding uh, space and uh, life science or biomedicine. Um, maybe I'll start and then I pass the baton to Julia. Um, uh, in my opinion, there are at least uh, um, uh, three or four dimensions there. Uh, when we spe speak about the interaction between uh, medical pharma and uh, uh, and the space, uh, the first one is uh, pharmaceutical research, uh, as mentioned by uh, Cristiano. There are multiple experiments on the International Space Station and also in other uh, vectors. Uh, for instance, you can uh, basically you can uh, um, leverage the microgra microgravity conditions uh, or uh, almost vacuum conditions that you can find in space in order to perform experiments uh, and see how uh, drugs uh, or vaccines they behave uh, in general bi um, biochemical molecules they behave uh, in those kind of environments in order in order to understand better the same is true for microbiology you can study bacteria virulence antibiotic resistance uh, biofilms uh, and see how they um, uh, how those features uh, uh, and the objects uh, and life systems they uh, behave in space uh, you can perform uh, uh, medical research on astronauts when they stay for a long time in the space station you can study the genetic the degenerative diseases uh, uh, osteoporosis uh, immunology cancer development and so on and also be because you are developing um, special technology for helping the astronauts to live in space in 
in extreme conditions. You can then put back in on earth uh, those technologies for uh, orthopedics, uh, rehabilitation, uh, medical imaging, and so on. So the, 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 um, uh, um, the interaction between uh, medical and life science and space is, uh, is, is very interesting on my side. <laughs> Yes, maybe I would add only the telemedicine that is becoming it will become important in the in the coming years. And so the opportunity to operate maybe a patient which lives on the other side of the world and rely on the satellite communication system on the satellite transmit data transmission systems. And this will be particularly important, but it's still on the way to be developed because, of course, it is it's very complicated and it requires also a stable connections. And yeah, this is what I know. And I think, Rafaela, you have covered almost all the topics. So we can go to the next question, but I think I'd leave it to you because I don't know much about it. So maybe... Okay, I will say that just to, to, to mention a few uh, potential applications of computer vision uh, uh, in space, I think there are multiple uh, areas that you can explore uh, from um, like um, obstacle detection, uh, detection of uh, um, of uh, how we'll say celestial bodies, uh, aircraft navigation, um, tracking space debris, as uh, we mentioned before, um, asteroid detection, the spacecraft docking, which is one of the most delicate uh, um, phases uh, uh, when you when you develop when you manage the space infrastructure, um, and of course uh, uh, all everything related to uh, to uh, understanding the environment. So like. Uh, in the automotive industry on Earth, uh, you need computer vision in order to automate uh, as much as possible the behavior of the of your vehicles. The, the same is true for space. So I think it's a promising uh, field of, of, uh, of operations. Okay, and the next question is how, um, okay, how can we find example of space data sets such as images or numerical? Um, if you refer to the to the data that are collected from the satellites itself, which are not elaborated, because as I was uh, telling before, there are this is now a new business of this of of companies that take this data, interpret them, analyze them, and sell them back again to the company who needs who needs them to respond to a specific need. But there are the data set provided by Copernicus and Galileo 2, there are like open source, Landsat 2, and if you want, you can write, te text me an email, I write my email down, and I can send you a few links of the portals, of the AO, AO portals that are available on the internet, and maybe you can take the data from there. Um, okay, so the next question, I don't know, do you want to add anything else, Rafaela? Oh, I think it's, uh, it's okay, okay. Uh, so I go. <laughs> Okay, so according to this business, which is very unique, if you want to work in it with AI experience, it is not, it is not many companies that will limit opportunities. Is this correct? Uh, okay, no, it's true that uh, in comparison with the other, um, I would say, other uh, industries like the digital industry, uh, of course, there are. The, the, if I understood the question correctly, so now the volume of um, career positions. Uh, are much smaller. So if you look at the digital industry, of course, the titans like uh, uh, Google, uh, Facebook, and so on, they are hiring uh, hundreds uh, of uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, experts and uh, developers. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the, the, the downstream segment, so an entire segment of the space industry is based on data. So all the business model that we see on Earth, they are based on the collection, uh, elaboration, and application application of data. And the, most of those companies, they need uh, some kind of data science, uh, in the most abstract way, or in the most advanced one, some kind of uh, uh, AI uh, algorithm development. Uh, so I think that there are multiple opportunities. Uh, actually, Icospace, uh, one of the companies that I mentioned before, is hiring. And um, there are also other ones in Italy that are working on this side. So I think that there are opportunities if you are passionate about this industry. Yeah, and if you want maybe to 
to have more information about it. It is very interesting to, to see the portfolio of the ESA Bix network, which and there on this portfolio are tons of startups that are supported by, by the by ESA. And there you can see, according to the different fields of interest, where how they apply artificial intelligence and in which field they operate. Maybe, maybe Julia, you can send me all these links and I will send them yeah, to, of course. to okay. all, the, all uh, the fellow and thank you so much. Great. Okay. Um, I don't know. Are there any other questions? I don't think so. Um, I, 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 I didn't mention it before, but uh, uh, if you want to go in depth in the, these uh, topics, uh, I also wrote, wrote a book called I Cancelli del Cielo. So um, it's a book about geopolitics and uh, the geopolitics and the economics of uh, space exploration. And uh, it just came out one week ago and uh, it's from uh, Lewis University Press. Sorry, I have a question, if I can. <clears throat> it's, uh, I just want in your opinion. Uh, do you think that the biggest innovation today in the space domain, of course, is brought by, you know, the private sector or the public sector, like from the European Space Agency, NASA, et cetera, or from uh, startups and uh, in general, or maybe from academia, I don't know, which is more, more important in your opinion right now? Uh, I, I, I will say neither. So, uh, so my, my personal opinion is that both are very relevant. So we cannot uh, uh, forget uh, nor the public sector nor the private sector. Uh, public sector is fundamental uh, for basic research, is fundamental for funding uh, exploration missions that otherwise will not have a business model. Uh, so we cannot uh, live uh, within the public sector. On the other hand, uh, the private sector was uh, uh, as much as fundamental for some kind of disruptive innovation. So for instance, if we think about re reusable rockets, uh, people thought that the reusable rockets were impossible up until a few years ago, and now they are used on a routine basis, and that, that's because of uh, SpaceX. So basically, at, in or, at least uh, to make them a routine. And, um, and uh, the kind of methodologies and uh, uh, anti-bureaucratic mindset uh, and speed uh, applied by startups, uh, in my opinion, uh, was one of the essential uh, elements of the new wave of the space economy, including part of the technological innovation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question, and uh, my question is a little bit political one. Uh, one country who controls the space and also can control the Earth. So uh, I see that on your website that the United States, for example, has the vast majority of satellites. So in just case, I mean, is there any, uh, for example, uh, United States or some other country that has the dominance in the space, what could be the repercussions on the, uh, politically on the earth? And this is one question. And the second one is that, is there any uh, regulation, I mean, uh, related to space and uh, with regard to uh, exploration and, and, and so on? Could you please repeat the first question? Uh, the, uh, the first, if, if I see that the, on your website, this the United States has the vast majority of satellites. So, mm -hmm. uh, and also the, on one of the slides that they spend the probably five or six times as much as the European budget on space. So, which means that in any country, like for example, in the United States has the, has the dominance in this space, I mean, over the, let, let's say the two decade, decades, what could be the repercussions on the earth? I mean, from the political standpoint and so on, or maybe an, another country that has the dominance. So is there any, any thoughts and some scenarios, things like that? Julia, do you want to start or I go? You can start if you want to. Okay. So my perception is that, uh, um, um, 
we, we should not say, see just the, the you know the current current variables, but also their dynamics, their derivative. I would say. So um, in, uh, I see the future of space much more multipolar. Uh, the the kind of growth that we see in uh, China, for instance. Uh, uh, is incredible. Uh, I think that that Asia, uh, at least China plus India combined, will launch uh, uh, thousands of satellites in the future. And uh, so the, 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 I see a um, potential uh, a more balanced uh, uh, situation in the future. I think at least there's a trend line. So anything can happen, but at least there's a trend line. I think that the, uh, is a, um, what we see now is not will not last uh, forever. Uh, secondly, there is also a backlash from other countries and groups because uh, actually the, I would say that the most the greatest superpower in uh, space is not the United States is uh, SpaceX specifically. Uh, they have much more satellites than anyone else, and also the launch capability. And uh, so basically, Bezos, for instance, is trying to uh, provide contracts with Amazon to not just to his own company. Uh, Blue Origin, but also to other SpaceX competitors in order to counterbalance, uh, and uh, also other countries and uh, con continents, especially Europe, uh, Russia, and India, uh, will be much more active and try to develop their own sovereign uh, capabilities, both in terms of satellites and launch capabilities. So I think that the future will be very dynamic, and there is no, um, it's not obvious that the, the kind of dominance of the United States will stay forever. Yeah, I agree with Raffaele, but I think also that it is important also for the international scenario to realize also the power that private companies have and are developing even more day by day, and they must be considered slow, not, not slowly actually, there should be like, it should be accelerated to consider them as geopolitical actors, as they have the, now the power to influence the international scenario, and this is very important in my opinion. And coming now to your second question, there is the um, the Outer Space Treaty, which was um, which has been disclosed in sixty seventh. But the problem is of all the treaties that they're not um, not all the states do participate and are legally binding to it. And at the same time, it they were disclosed in the in in an area which was developed, which was dominated by the by the countries and states, and not by the private parties, which now dominate the scene in the space environment. And this is becoming a big issue, especially because there's a liability problem, as I was said, uh, as I was telling before, together with Raffaele, because if you have um, space debris can hit your satellite, but then you have to you have to provide evidence of who is actually responsible for it did you apply the right um, did you apply the right protection did it actually hit you because maybe there was a cyber attack and it and the, the satellite was put actually was maneuvered in another orbit so that it was it could be hit by by um by a space debris so there are different different issues which are discussed on an international stage and but the treaties the problem is they have to be modernized to the actual state of the art uh, thank you especially the first question as it was very relieving thank you <laughs> Uh, just, just let me add uh, more uh, fear. So um, um, there is a, uh, there is another development that for me is uh, uh, very interesting. Is the fact that uh, uh, we, we think of, of space as a like an infinite or very broad uh, environment, which is true. But actually, there are uh, uh, some places that in the that in the future will be very contended, especially for instance, the Lagrangian points. Uh, so if you study the um, mechanics, uh, if there are uh, multiple bodies, uh, there are some equilibrium points uh, that, that from the point of view of applications, they could be very interesting. So the stuff can stay there uh, in, in equilibrium. So especially the Lagrangian points between the Earth and the Moon, uh, they are like uh, channels uh, in, in, in the oceans uh, or, the, or the seas. And I think there the space will not be unlimited. And, uh, uh, and actually there is 
there is there is already a discussion about who gets there first uh, and uh, establishing uh, power there and uh, in order to leave others uh, away so, um, so we'll see so there are a lot of things happening thank you yes that that's one of the reason why of also this lagrangian point or strategical places is the reason why we need to develop as humanity a view of us as humanity and not different people uh, races uh, or different uh, because otherwise we are uh, i don't know <laughs> i prefer not to mention the word but uh, you can understand uh, so we need really to change our our setup our mind and um, and stop so this is my opinion very good opinion so if we uh, if you don't have any other uh, questions i think uh, it was really interesting not only uh, for the for Giulia and uh, uh, Raffaele's speech, really interesting, but we interact also a lot during this, uh, this talk. And was, um, uh, you see, that, that, that's the, the main point, uh, is the, dis the discussion, discussion that we can, we can have together. And uh, okay, I, can, I want to thank you really very much. I will write you soon just to collect uh, also the links uh, you 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 mentioned and uh, thank you very much from uh, for being uh, here and uh, have a good uh, everybody have a good evening and i hope to see you uh, another time i don't know the next session <laughs> and stop thank you, thank you so much have thank a nice day we do thank you very much <laughs> <Really>. <laughs>